Welcome back to Pelsall Times Ghost Channel and part two of last month's story. In January this year, I was contacted by filmmaker Gavin Repton, who had stumbled across the Pelsall Times Ghost Channel on YouTube and was keen to include some of my work in his film stroke documentary about the paranormal. Gavin will be including four ghost stories from the Pelsall Times Ghost Channel in his documentary, including this story and the former. Once his production is completed, Gavin intends to show the film documentary at a variety of film festivals including Cannes and other festivals which may be paranormal or horror specific. In amongst so many other stories of the paranormal Gavin has taken from around the country, the film stroke documentary will also include interviews with Jason Bray, Anglican priest and exorcist and writer of the book Deliverance and paranormal historian Richard Felix. When asked about which stories I found the most intriguing I named quite a few but this one had really captured my imagination as I could compare it to no other in that all the houses on this estate seemed to be haunted. Still intrigued by the stories of this and of Pelsall Ambulance Training Centre which occupied the site before the new houses were built, I suggested this particular property. I then contacted the occupant to ask if she would be interested in being part of the film stroke documentary. She very kindly agreed then took me by surprise as she started to tell me about what had gone on since we spoke last. To say I was shocked is an understatement. Since my last visit, the occupant told me that paranormal activity had got far worse, so much so that in the end the occupant had no alternative but to turn to psychic mediums in order to have her house exercised. In doing so, the occupant was able to see why her house was so haunted and why vengeful spirits had started to attack her and other family members. When I asked her what had happened, she began her story. To begin with, she told me that about seven years ago, her son was pinned to the bed by invisible hands around his throat while he was fully awake and watching TV. Her son was 18 stone and 6 foot 4 and would not have been easy to hold down. Then she told me that sometime later, after having an argument, the occupant decided to lie on the king-sized bed in the haunted bedroom for half an hour. Before long she had drifted off to sleep. Then suddenly she became aware of something getting in the bed. She was startled and froze. Then she felt pressure on the quilt, as if something was lying on top of her. Then she felt and heard something breathe in her face. She was convinced that whatever it was, it was not human, but animal-like. She was petrified and remained froze. Then suddenly the heavy king-size quilt was whipped off her and thrown across the room. This was the point at which she felt there was no alternative but to have the house exercised and cleared of spirits because she and her family were now absolutely terrified and did not know what might happen next. The occupant told me that the family were no longer bothered by the night nurse or the miner. 
However, now things seem to be somehow different. Things still often went missing, then turned up later. But now this caused no end of arguments in the household. Neighbours also continued to experience strange things. For one neighbour, it was not unusual for her to return home and find a freshly boiled kettle. She often saw strange things in her house out of the corner of her eye. Another neighbour was rather alarmed when an old sapphire and diamond ring was found in the garden by the cat. After taking the ring to a specialist, the neighbour was told that the ring had some age to it, but he could not understand why it was there. After the occupant told me this, I began some further investigations on what used to exist where the houses now stood. According to my research, Pelsell Ambulance Training Centre, which previously occupied the site, was also haunted. This rather large building was said to experience a range of paranormal activity. The presence of ghosts at the ambulance training centre was a well-known fact. The kitchen and one of the classrooms was said to be very much a hotspot for paranormal activity. Doors in the building were often slammed by unseen hands and the grey lady was often seen. One cleaner experienced what can only be described as an invisible presence sitting on the end of a bed. Unable to straighten the sheets on the bed, the indentation there suggested that there was something sitting on the end of the bed. The cleaner told the presence to move, and it did. A student nurse once commented that she had felt a presence in her room all night. Once told about the ghosts, the student nurse never slept at the ambulance training centre again. The old outhouse buildings still in situ at the time were always regarded as a no-go area and were avoided at all costs. No one ever liked to be alone in the ambulance training centre. One of the cleaners recalled that the ghosts at the ambulance training centre were friendly rather than sinister. Two other cleaners were said to talk freely with the ghosts, one of whom was a man in black. Previous to this, the village hall occupied this space. The village hall, as seen in the photograph, was built by the Charles family of Pelsall Hall in 1856. It is believed that the village hall was built directly on the foundations of the 1311 church, which once existed there. The doors of the 1311 church became the doors of the village hall. In the beginning, the Charles family used the village hall to put on entertainment for the villagers. However, in 1924, the village hall was converted into a dining and recreation room for patients of Pelsall Hall Sanatorium. In 1950, Pelsall Hall Sanatorium closed and all staff and patients were moved to Goscott Hospital. Although the photograph of Evelyn St John was found at Goscott Hospital many years ago, it may be the case that Evelyn once worked at Pelsall Hall Sanatorium. During my research, I discovered a photograph of Pelsall Hall Sanatorium in the early days, having steel stairs at the end of the building, which may account for the place of the accident which ended Evelyn's life. With regards to the haunted bedroom, the occupant said that her house had been built above what was once the morgue used by Pelsall Hall Sanatorium. Hence, it could be said that there were many reasons why the houses on this estate should be haunted. 
The plan here shows a number of unknown buildings on the site where the houses were built. The village hall survived until 1985 when it was demolished to make way for Pelsall Ambulance Training Centre. That said, now what bothered the occupant more than anything was that she felt the paranormal activity had somehow become personal. On one occasion the occupant took off her large heavy gold wedding ring whilst she washed up. Later it was nowhere to be seen. She had the house upside down looking for it but still it was nowhere to be seen. As this had happened before with phone charges and other insignificant things she wasn't surprised. But somehow this was different. After the ring had been missing for a couple of weeks and had not turned up the occupant had had enough. Knowing that there was a presence in the house she shouted at the top of her voice demanding for the return of the wedding ring. After leaving the house in frustration when the occupant returned the ring had returned and was next to the phone on the table. After this and the physical attacks the occupant had had enough. It was then that she decided that it was time to have the house exercised. In order to have the house exercised, the occupant brought in five psychics. When they arrived at the house to perform the exorcism, they first created a circle of protection. The occupant told me that almost straight away one of the psychics declared that upstairs was the problem particularly the locked off room. Then one of the psychics told the occupant that there was a Ouija board in the house and that it had been used and had created a vortex in the closed off bedroom bringing in with it many spirits. Whilst most of the spirits brought in by the Ouija board were dealt with quickly and moved on by the exorcism the psychics did have trouble getting rid of one of the ghosts who had a fixation with the occupant. This ghost disliked the occupant and thought she was untidy. She didn't like the way the occupant was looking after her house. The psychics told the occupant that this ghost was a lady with snatched back hair and a sour pinched face and was around 4 foot 11 tall. She wore a long black skirt and had a white apron over her clothing. The ghost was said to be that of a housekeeper to an old vicarage who had taken a dislike to the occupant. According to my research there was indeed an old vicarage along Paradise Lane when the old church existed there between 1311 and 1843. The vicarage was said to be a half-timbered building with a thatched roof. The psychics told the occupant that the ghostly housekeeper of the vicarage had been there long before the Ouija board had invited the others in and had been quite happy to exist alongside the occupant. Despite hating the occupant so much the ghostly housekeeper did not want to leave. After telling the occupant this, the psychics began their task as the occupant sat on the bed in the haunted bedroom. The psychics were determined to force the housekeeper out. The occupant said that the psychics had to scream at the ghostly housekeeper but she was having none of it, she wanted to stay. The occupant remained sat on the bed. The occupant told me that the psychic screamed and screamed and screamed to get the housekeeper to leave the house. Eventually they did manage to evict the spirit. However, before it went it left four claw marks on the occupant's back which made her jump out of her skin. After the exorcism, the atmosphere in the house lifted. 
However, the occupant still does not use the room as it remains locked.